in one of his writings that described when he was not converted that God's grace hunted him down and that's probably true of more of us than we might initially admit your grace it's great grace it's finding grace we're testimonies of that folks the Lord found us and made sure that we would find Christ Isn't that wonderful the Spirit of God sent by the Father and the Son found us to make sure that we would find Christ and that was done by the way it wasn't done in a vacuum think about back when you were saved think about that now you may have been saved the very first time you heard the gospel I know people like that but the salvation that you and I have experienced came in part a large part because somebody was faithful to sow some gospel seed we're talking about that today we're looking at this parable of the soils we we've been in this passage now for three Sundays the first Sunday we we looked at Jesus explanation of why he taught in parables then we came back last Sunday we actually looked at the parable itself we we read the text where he states the parable then we read the text where he explained it and we began looking at an explanation of it last week if you have your Bible turn to Mark chapter 4 we're going to read verses 1 to 20. I want to maintain the context of what we're dealing with today. If you don't have a Bible with you, and you would like one, see me after the service, and we'll talk about getting you one. But if you don't have it right now, we're going to put the text up on the screens for you so that you can see the Word and follow along as I read. Stand with me if you would. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, and since it had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears, let him hear. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable so so he was t he had taught some other parables that are just not recorded here and he said to them to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God but for those outside everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven and he said to them do you not understand this parable how then will you understand all the parables the sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, when they hear. And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves but endure for a little while then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world of the word immediately they fall away and others are the ones sown among thorns they are those who hear the word but the cares of the world 
and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But for those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's, let's hear this passage today. From the vantage point of those who have had the Word sown in their lives and it's born fruit and you're a follower of Christ. From the vantage point of those who have maybe been around the Word but it's fallen on a hard path or shallow soil or among the thorns you haven't received it really for those who are sowers of the word thank you be seated I told you that this passage I think breaks down along four lines first there's the parable of the soils stated Second, there's a strong exhortation in verse 9, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Third, the parable of the soils explained, and then I want to add a fourth, a shocking warning. This comes from Matthew, Matthew's telling of this, recounting of this story. Well, we've already looked at the parable of the soils stated. We looked at the strong exhortation. If you have ears to hear, than here. And here is, and this word here is more than just hearing words. It's hearing with a view to embracing, hearing with a view to obeying, hearing with a view to responding. Some have heard the word preached over and over and over and over and over, never have responded, never have responded. If you have ears to hear, here, embrace it. So we're going to look at the parable of the soils explained. That's where we left off uh, last week. We were looking at the uh, how the sower sower sows the word. This is one of those things where Jesus, when you look at other parables, he's he re referring to himself, but by application, he's referring to all of them. And what what happens is this becomes this will become for them a way of understanding that if Jesus is Messiah, why aren't people by the droves turning to him and following him? And what he's going to do is he's going to give his disciples a lesson in the kinds of people or the kinds of human hearts they encounter because each of these ground images, the hard path, speaks of a hard heart. The shallow path speaks of an impetuous heart, where there's a re religious experience but no salvation. The, the ground that has thorns is a, of the heart who wants Jesus, but wants Jesus and, then you begin to fill in the blank. And if you want Jesus and, then you don't have Jesus. Then the last one, the good soil. And as you hear this, those of you who are followers of Christ, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to rejoice today because you see, you are good soil. That's not that you're better than anybody else. It's just in the Lord's providence, somebody had worked in you. Somebody had worked on you. Somebody had prayed for you. I've told you about my godly mother who prayed for me. You know, the older I get, the more I, it dawns on me that I probably was... was when I was growing up, more like my father than I realized I was. And I think my mother had this terror that I would turn out like him. Oh, she sowed the seed. She sowed it and sowed it and sowed it. Prayed, Lord, water the seed. Take the stony heart and make it soft. She prayed through my rebellion. She prayed through my religious impersonation. And the soil was finally made receptive to the seed. And so we're looking last week at these, these four soils. 
Jesus is the sower, and if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, so are you. The gospel is the seed, the word of the kingdom. And if you take the gospel as it is, then it's, it's good, wonderful seed. But if you twist it, if you water it down, if you pervert it, if you take it and turn it for your own purposes, it's not the gospel. The only seed he's talking about here is the gospel. The truth that Jesus Christ came and lived and died and rose again and offers salvation to all who will repent of their sin and trust in him. The simple gospel. There's people that have, there's, you know, we have this uh, hybrid germination going on where you get some of these strange looking uh, vegetables and strange looking fruits because they're messing with them genetically, genetically messed with. We do not need to mess with the gospel. We simply need to declare the gospel. And it's a simple message. So the seed is the gospel. Jesus, is, as he's teaching this, he's been doing this. He's been sowing gospel seed wherever he goes. Crowds gather, and he doesn't say, now, some of you don't need to hear this, or some of you it's not going to do any good to hear this. He just scatters the truth among the crowds. He meets individuals, and he, and he just dumps gospel seed upon them. And it had to be perplexing to the disciples. If this is the Messiah and we see that, why do others not see that? Jesus is explaining that to them. And also preparing them for what they would experience. The four soils from our text. It's the hard path the rocky ground, the thorns, and the good soil. We talked about the hard path last week. Let me just reiterate quickly. It's a hard heart. It's a heart that, for whatever reason, has been hardened. And let me tell you something. Every time you hear the gospel preached, whether, whether I'm standing here doing this, whether you're in your Bible study class and it's happening, whether you're in home, in, at home in your family devotions, whether you hear it on the radio, see it on a billboard, hear it on TV, hear it from one of your peers, one of your friends, hear it at work, hear it at play. Every time it's proclaimed to you, there's two responses to it. One is an embracing of it, believing it to be true, resulting in a confession of sin and the embrace of faith, believing Jesus Christ to be the only Savior of sinners. There's that response, or there's the non-response. It's the, oh, just one more time. Can't wait till the preacher stops preaching. I've got things to do today. But it's a hard heart. You don't take anything with you. You get up from the couch in your, in your home when you finish family devotions and for as soon as you get to the place where you brush your teeth, prepare for bed, you've forgotten what you just heard. A hard heart. I just pray for you if you're, if you're identified by that today. Cry out to God, Lord, do whatever has to be done to make my heart soft. Lord, you've promised in your word that you would give the Holy Spirit in the new covenant and when he comes that he would take out the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Lord, take out my stony heart. Why do I not care? I want to care. You see, for the hard path, for the hard heart, you'll be responsible for every gospel exposure you've had. We won't delve into it today, but I just would remind you in Luke's gospel when, when Jesus is telling the story about, about the rich man and the beggar who was at his gate. They both died. The rich man in hell wanted water, no water. He wanted to warn his family. No. And then in the, in the story that Jesus is telling, 
this figure of Father Abraham, who is, who is a symbol of heaven, says, My son, remember. Hell will be a place of torment, no doubt about it. But one of the torments of hell will be remembering every time someone shared the gospel with you. Remembering every time a mother shed her tears for you. Every time a dad pled with you. Every time a Bible study teacher loved on you and, and wanted you to trust Christ. Every time a preacher pled with you. And all those things that you could not wait to forget and put out of your mind will be in the condemned conscience for all of eternity. Remember. The rocky ground is a little different. It's a superficial expression. We, we have way too much of this today. People hear something that typically it happens this way. They're, they're in some kind of trouble relationally, physically, financially. And they get exposed to the gospel and in their minds that becomes the quick fix. If I just trust in Jesus then all these problems will go away. Sadly, sadly there are some preachers who present it that way. Jesus taught a gospel. He said, when you, when you trust me in the gospel, then your troubles will just begin. But this rocky ground or shallow ground heart, this deceived heart. It's an explanation, by the way, for you and I could think back and you know people at one point, these were, these were what John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress calls a fair, flourishing believer. And they're not now. They don't want anything to do with religion, which we could say to them, well, that's good, because neither do we. They won't want anything to do with Christianity, with Christ, with Christians, with the gathering of Christians. Oh, one time they seemed excited. Man, they were leading out, and doing this and doing that, just so dependable, so, and then they fizzled. Because there was no root. And I believe that church roles today, most churches, not ours, thank God, most churches' roles are filled with rocky path believers, which is to say, with non believers. I had a professor in seminary that would say, a faith that fizzles is false from the first. Which ought to make all of us who are followers of Christ pray, Dear God, I don't want to fizzle. I, I don't want to outlive my, my trust in Christ. <laughs> I want to live by faith. I want to die in faith. I want to, I want to confess Jesus on my deathbed. I don't want to fizzle. The third is the thorns. These are folks... They have a lot of things mixed in their lives. And Jesus Christ, their receiving of Jesus Christ is not for them the embracing of Jesus Christ as Lord, as Lord of my life. Jesus Christ is something else or someone else who they confess that they need, but they think getting Jesus Christ will make them happy. And they don't ever say it this way, but I mean after nearly 40 years of counseling, uh, in marital counseling, believers who say to me, confessing believers say, well, if only, then there's something you fill in the blank, see? If only this would happen. If only this, I could experience this. If only, and you, it, you can fill it up with a thousand different things. But see, if only faith is not faith. Not saving faith. They want Jesus, the text says, they want riches. They want other things. It's kind of tough to sing all that thrills my soul is Jesus and then grumble about something in your life. Thorny ground, the cares of life. Jesus himself would teach his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. Now I've told you before, the word for trouble there 
in the original language is the word thalipsis. It means in this world you will be squeezed. Now we haven't felt the squeezing like our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world feel it. You know, we say things like, well, I thought he was going to take my head off. But no one's really threatened to behead us because we're Christians. The rocky soil, the thorny ground. You see, the gospel comes in as the seed that germinates and begins to overpower thorns. Brother Lynn Ritter can tell you from this work out in front here how ridiculous it is to have to deal with thorns. <laughs> how they, they hinder you. You're trying to nurture some plant to grow and the thorns thrive, flourish. But in the garden that Jesus Christ is building, there will be thorns, there will be thistles, but they will be overshadowed and, and overcome by the powerful blooming of the grace of God in the life of a Christian. So that, not so that you say, well, I don't have any problems, but so that you say, you know something? God has he showed up and manifested himself in the midst of every problem, every concern. Jesus is all the world to me. I, I need no other friend. And when you have that in your heart, then you won't get choked out by the world. Is it saying that having riches is wrong? No. It's the deceitfulness of thinking that riches will give you real joy. Is it saying that having other things is wrong? No. It's the inordinate desire for other things. You see, if a wife says, if only my husband would, da, 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 then I would be happy. If a husband says, if only my wife would, da, 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 then I would be happy. If only I had this, dot, 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 then I'd be happy. See, the dot, dot, dot says, Jesus is not enough to make me happy. This thorny ground is a Jesus and something. It's not real faith. But there's the good soil, bless God. Verse 20, those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. You hear the word. And you accept it. You embrace it. You receive it. It's, it's like a young man going off to camp. A good young man. A kind young man. A sensitive young man. Meeting Jesus. Everything begins to be different. It's phenomenal to watch. And brothers and sisters, you may say, I'm just not feeling that today, preacher. But I'm going to tell you, there was a time when you did. If you're a follower of Christ, there was a time when you did. When the word, the gospel in your life was producing fruit. No fruitless Christians. Now don't let somebody else define for you what fruit looks like. Go to the Word. The fruit of the Gospel is an abiding in Christ's Spirit, Jesus says. The fruit of the Gospel is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, long-suffering. You see, attitudes that are manifest. There's gospel fruit. A servant heart. And that doesn't mean you've got to go around the world and lay down your life. It may that mean that for some of you. But perhaps you can come together and fix food to serve our neighbor. 
just wanting to serve. Perhaps you see an opportunity to serve one another. You see one of the members is in need, needs furniture. And you determine, I'm not just going to say go in peace, be warm and filled. I hope you get that. You act. Someone needs to move. You act. You see, folks, I think sometimes, and you are precious people, I think sometimes the devil just messes with you as if to say, you're not doing anything. You're not counting for anything. Don't let him lie to you like that. Producing fruit. Fruit. The fruit of a love for Christ. The fruit of a love for God. You see, when we adopted our purpose statement, follow Christ, love God, love others, serve the world, we were not setting some sort of a standard that we hoped somebody could achieve that was just, we just gave sort of a definition of a functioning Christian. And fruit is produced. And I want to say to you, and we ought to say this to one another, I delight when I see your lives taking on more of the character of Christ. I delight in that. Gospel fruit. And you won't know what that is if you're not a follower of Christ yet. In fact, you could say the person who's not a follower of Christ, his life is fruitless. He or she is a fruit tree bearing no fruit. It's, it's good for nothing. It's sapping up uh, moisture from the soil and taking up space. Dead trees ultimately need to cut, be cut down before they fall on something or someone and do damage. So I want to encourage you today, you fellow believers, you fellow strugglers, you fellow members of this wonderful family of faith, that I bless God for the fruit in your life that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. But here's, here's the deal. We would all agree we've been given much. And Matthew told in this parable, in Matthew 13, 12, a warning from Jesus. For to the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The Pharisees had all kinds of privileges by virtue of being Jews in the covenant. The covenants were, belonged to the Jews. They had all kinds of privileges in that they were able to spend the time memorizing what was their Bible in the day, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. But all of that profited them nothing because they settled for religion. They let the things that they had be an end in themselves rather than a means to pointing to Christ and provoking a glorifying of God. And what they had was taken away. And the biggest takeaway they experienced was in 70 AD when by God's hand and providence the temple as he had prophesied was leveled to the ground. No stone. And they to this day to this day, they have no temple. Brothers and sisters, we've been given a lot. We are in the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. And we're believers in this nation. We're the most blessed people <laughs> in this nation. But you see, those blessings, as we praise God from whom all blessings flow, it's there to flow. They're not, they're not to be dammed up in us. They're to flow in that they might flow out. We, we sing it. We breathe in His grace. We breathe out His praise. 
Because here's the shocking reality here. A sack of gospel seed does no good in the sack. There's a promise that those that sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30 and 60 and 100 fold. And see, I've, I'm, I'm concerned that some people may have said, well, I'm, I'm going to, Brother Bill, I'm going to be trying to do, I'm going to share. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow. And, and, and the seed has fallen on hard ground. And you, and you looked at it and you said, well, that was a waste of time. And it's fallen on the shallow ground and someone seemed to come alive and then they died again. Well, that didn't do any good either. And then the rocky ground, you sow it and and people seem to embrace it and then the cares of life, the, the distractions, Jesus is not enough to satisfy them. And you get discouraged, but see, there's this other soil. And if you faithfully sow, some gospel seed will fall on this soil. It fell on you. It fell on you. And grace blossomed in your life. So, my thought today. The promise in the text here, by example. The promise that we read from Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Let me ask you something. When was the last time? Alone. I'm not talking about in public. That you wept over someone's soul. Not just concerned because they're lost. But wept over their soul. When was the last time you got so burdened for a person? That you could not help but gather with the people of God and say, will you pray for me? Pray with me? Pray for so and so? As best I know, they're not saved. If you sow in tears, you shall reap with shouts of joy. This young lady is not able to be with us because she and her husband and family have had to move for his military connections. I would just remind you that Keisha Hines, several years ago, people were praying for her. Her family members were saying, pray for her. And then remember, she showed up. <laughs> she would come every now and then uh, originally and, and, and had not, not much for this, just being dutiful to her husband. But she showed up. And she was in a prayer meeting one night, sitting right over there. And we had groups back then, sitting awkwardly in these pews. And she, we were praying for her. At the end of the prayer service, she came to me. She said, can I talk with you? I said, sure. She began to share with me how during, during prayer meeting, the Lord just came upon her and saved her. It was glorious. We baptized her sometime after that. And then she reconnected with her dad. She and her mom and dad and family had been in a cult. She reconnected with him. In the course of time, through her witness and the prayers of the people of God and our loving on him and encouraging him, he was saved. Then they reconnected with his brother, her uncle. In the course of time, loving on him, sharing with him, he was saved. And he's, he's in heaven today. What if? What if we hadn't prayed for her? What if we'd not taken that gospel seed and said, Lord, save Keisha. And then sowed it in her life when we were around her. What if she had been converted and she didn't take gospel seed and share it with her dad? 
What if they had not shared it with his brother? Eternity still comes, whether we want it or not. It still comes. Reaping with shouts of joy. And as if, as if we didn't get it the first time, verse 6, He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves, that is the fruit of what happens when you sow. Yes, brothers and sisters, some is going to fall on the hard path. And it will be like you never talked to them. Some will fall on shallow soil. And you'll get excited because it seems like there's a springing up. But then there's a withering away and you get disappointed. Some will fall on the rocky soil and, and you'll, you'll think there's something going on there spiritually. But, but we'll soon demonstrate that the world is too much with them. They, they, haven't, they haven't learned to live in, in the world and not be of the world. They've, they've not heeded the, the, the warning of John in 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, that doesn't come from the Father. It comes from the world. And all of that's going to pass away. And you see this person get choked out and you get discouraged. And see, the devil wants us to focus on the hard path the shallow ground and the thorny ground and, and discourage us hopefully so that we won't keep sowing to see the good soil where it springs up. And I thank God people didn't stop sowing in my life. There was a season when I looked like hard ground. Some of you could tell the same story. I thank God that they just kept praying and sowing. So here's my challenge as we go. When you were saved, you were given a sack of gospel seed. And I would imagine that when you were first saved, you were reaching in that sack an awful lot. Somewhere over time, life became too busy. Discouragements too many. And you got out of the habit of reaching in and scattering. We have bird feeders across our kitchen, the windows in our kitchen. And you have to fill those things up all the time. But when you don't, you know what? Those birds come to that feeder and they'll swing on the empty thing and it bangs up on the glass. We know it's empty. We've got to fill it again. I think sinners all around us are doing something like that. And all it takes is for us to be attuned to that with hand in the seed sack and sowing. And he has promised we'll reap a harvest. If we don't reap a harvest individually and as a church, then it won't be because he's broken his promise. It'll be that we have too much seed left in our sacks. So I encourage you today to go and sow. I told you we're going to be giving you, when we get back from vacation, giving you some, some simple tools I think you're going to enjoy learning and having at the ready. And a commitment, a new and fresh commitment that we, as a family of faith known as Bethel Baptist Church, we commit to sow gospel seed promiscuously. We're going to throw it everywhere. And trust the Lord to bring 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold when it hits good soil. It's not our business to be soil testers. Our business is to sow. Let's pray.